I'm Rachel Goldsworthy and welcome to the drive home to Hawkesbury where I believe every home has a story and I love sharing those stories on real estate in the Hawkesbury with you. Here we share the best ways to add value to your property, how to avoid the common mistakes people make when buying and selling property and how to get the maximum return on your investment with a focus on supporting local business. I live love Hawkesbury and can't wait to get into today's episode with you so let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this video. I'm Rachel Goldsworthy, checking in from Australia for you, and I'm joined by today Lisa and Sue Smedley. I'm just going to patch them in, and hopefully you'll be able to see them as well. There we go. Hey, girls, how are you going in America? We're doing great. Wonderful. Thank you. That's good. That's good. And I believe it's Halloween, so I've put a few little Halloween bits and pieces around the edges to celebrate your your day. Oh yes, it's been a scary day. I didn't think this was going to work. <laughs> scary for all of us. Technology is wonderful, especially when it works, isn't it? <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. So, what did you girls do for Halloween? Did you get up to some trick or treating? I did. I handed out candy. Probably, I don't know, it seemed like a thousand children, but it was probably only like 200. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> neighborhood is a popular one. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Great. Yeah, there's scary, or like uh, haunted houses, and everybody's just, it's a huge party. Like, yeah, all, lots, lots yeah. of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you do. No one comes to our house. It's on an isolated street. <laughs> A little cold sack. We normally go to Lisa's house and help deliver candy <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah, okay. But um, you, you just had a bit of fun and it was a good day for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think Australians have sort of embraced it a little bit. I know it's been more of an American tradition or known to be more of an American tradition, but I think over time many different cultures and people and, and parts of the world are adopting it as their own as well, which is always fun. That yeah. is. So what did you do? Well, I went to the folks' place and we had a really nice – they do trick-or-treating on uh, the peninsula in Windsor with the kids. So there's some of the houses that participate. They put a little orange balloon out for the, the houses that want to participate and um, then the kids know that that's a safe house to go to for when they want to do trick-or-treating. So if they see the orange balloon, they go into the house, the parents or whoever's in the house, they offer them, you know, obviously play the game and um, either get pranked or – they give a little bit of candy or whatever it is that happens. And, um, yeah, so that's what we ended up doing and had a little bit of a family get-together. So it was a nice night out. Oh, nice. Did you prank anybody? No. I left it for the kids <laughs> to prank me. <laughs> I always fall for their tricks, especially Robert, my little nephew. He's so cute. He's always got the girls running around after him um, and keeping everybody entertained, as is um, Catherine, my niece. So, yeah, it was, it was a good night, fun, fun time. So, yeah. So um, we finally got technology to work, which is great. And um, today I wanted to talk to everybody about, I guess, um, the American market because it is completely different to the Australian market, but similar in some respects. And I thought, who better to speak to than my favourite realtors, Lisa and Sue, um, because you, you guys have been realtors for quite a long time. Um, Sue, how many years is it now? 50 or 49, was it? Almost Jubilee? Oh, she's yeah. I don't think she's going to go over that edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, you know, you, you're 49 years and then, Lisa, you're – how many years have you been working inside by your mum? Like 28. 28, yeah. okay. Yeah. Crazy. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's – um. And, and what sort of things have you done together over the years? How's the business developed and how's it changed with technology and other things that you've done? Hmm. Well, I think I would say that she has had her way of doing it and always been exceptionally, exceptionally successful the way she does it. Yes. Face to face, every phone call, live everything. And since technology's taken over, it's given me an opportunity to like find some value in our relationship. <laughs> it's like to do a lot more of the technology. It makes me form, feel more important. No, but we're a good team. One person picks up where the other person drops it off. I mean, mother, daughter, we just kind of know what the other one's going to do or not do and fill it most of the time. Yes. Except yeah. for the appraisal today. We, had, we dropped the ball on appraisal. Oh, <laughs> you, you can't be perfect at everything, girls. Yeah. Oh, no, we can't. 
<laughs> Tell us about yours. I, I find this so interesting how different it is. Um, Cause like on our break, no one knows we were, ch we chatted a tiny bit while we waited for the technology to come up. And we were talking about how we have different ways of, of buying and selling the houses. And, and we list what is called an exclusive right to sell. So we list your house and, and we have the exclusive right to sell it. And we work hand in hand with all the other neighbors. We network strongly. I take a great deal of pride in being friends with as many realtors who will let me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I think that that's really important, isn't it? Because, you know, life's all about relationships and it's all about getting on with people in your neighborhood. And I would like to think that, you know, realtors and real estate agents in Australia, we all get on. There's enough for everybody. And I think that um, more of us should work together like you do over there because it's uh, important not only for, um, you know, ourselves, but more importantly for our clients because they benefit the most, don't they? Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, I was thinking like it, yours is a little bit harder to, I mean, like it seems a little uh, set up a little differently, I guess. Like you were yeah. saying you have a different way of listing and you, you sell more of a auction style. You had three different types that I had never even heard of the two others. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And tell me about the, you were talking about the round table style, Sue, of, of selling and, and how that's come about because of the scammers online trying to, you know, uh, take money from unsuspecting buyers. So, um, yeah. Hi, Amy, um, who's watching. Do you know, um, do you know Amy, girls? She's saying best realtors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Nice to see you online. Um, yeah, so sorry. You have a lender in the U.S. because she can do it all. She can do international. So there, you've got someone now. <laughs> Amy, that's excellent. We're really pleased that you're on the call with us, and certainly I'm sure there'll be some people that you'll be able to help out as we're going through. Um, yeah, but you're telling me about the roundtable and how that process works and how that avoids um, problems. So. Well, it's, you know, uh, it's a good opportunity for the buyer and seller to meet each other because yeah. they have not even seen each other. And um, everything is closed right then. So if they have questions, they can get the answers direct from each other. And a lot of times the seller will invite the buyer after the closing to come to their home that they just bought and they'd like to show them through and show them yeah. how things work and it, it just makes for a really good beginning for buying a new house yes yeah. the relationship between the two i mean like if your fireplace damper isn't going to open now you know them and you can call them and go hey can you give me the <laughs> tips on how to get that working <laughs> yeah because I think from an Australian perspective, you, you'd think, oh, my gosh, vendor and buyer in the same room. And, oh, we're going to keep them apart. You know? <laughs> but I think um, the concept of that is really nice because, as you say, it irons out a lot of things. You get around the table together. You talk it out. You shoot out whatever the, the objections are right up front. And it's very transparent. I love being, you know, I love a, pro a process that is transparent and everybody's on the same page because it makes the transaction much easier for everyone, I think. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, yes, absolutely. And a lot of times the uh, buyer has questions that they maybe did not, they thought of later and didn't have answers for. Absolutely. And sometimes the sellers have things they want to tell the buyer about their house and it's little unusual things. And um, yeah. there's just a lot of satisfaction in them getting to know each other and yeah. that off right. We also give a sheet out that shows all the utility companies and their phone numbers. And it also shows the buyer and seller each other's phone number. So if there is a problem, then they can call them. They'll always have their yeah. number on that paper. So yeah. As you say, it just irons out everything before it's even a problem and you just talk it through. So a great idea. Yeah, another great idea that I love that your realtors do over there is um, the MLS. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the multi-listing service and, and what it does and, and what's the best way for people to find a property if they're looking for a property um, online? You want to do that? Oh, well, I mean, we have our MLS system is all the agents, all, all the realtors in our area. And there's like several counties involved um, that all put our listings in the same spot. And yeah. that way we can all see each other's and what's going on and the commissions and stuff. And, and that's similar to what you would call what your private trade, I guess. Listing. Yeah, we've, we've got similar sorts of things like that, but also realestate.com and domain. They're the two main oh. 
realestate.com sort of the more west and the domains more the north shore um, style of um, percentage that we're getting the, the feedback on from the buyers where they're purchasing yeah yeah and then we have i mean and that's nice because then all the realtors can communicate but we also yeah. have zillow do you guys have yeah. zillow yeah. No, Zillow, I love Zillow over there because it's similar to, you know, even Google because, it, you know, you can be rated on Zillow, can't you? And um, people can find different things on there oh. and an estimate oh. or a estimate. Is it a Zillow? Yeah. And they're, but they're not always super accurate. So we're not no. as crazy about how that one. Realtor.com is huge. Yes. Um, they're, they are almost a direct feed from our multiple listing service. So okay. that's usually pretty accurate. But, and we now have a website with our board of realtors. Do you guys have like a board of realtors that like certain cities have all the realtors work for one group or? Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, Real Estate Institute of New South Wales is a body for each state. Um, but I don't believe we've got to that point where we're able to put all of our listings on that together, similar to what you're talking about at this point. Oh, that's interesting. So how do people find houses in Australia? Generally, they find houses, whether it's online, via a website, from the real estate agent's website, from realestate.com or domain or signage out the front. We're finding a lot of trend towards social media. Um, oh. You know, there's a lot of things on Facebook. There's a lot of things on Pinterest, you know, Google, where people are searching online. They're basically doing a resume check before they even meet you, which is great because, you know, it's the most – or one of the biggest transactions somebody will do in their life. And it's right. best to work with somebody you know, you trust, you, you, know, you know, you like, and because you're going to be in this transaction for at least a three-month period or generally around about that six weeks to three-month period. So if you don't know anybody, you've just moved to a particular state and you have no idea about it, it's you can go online, you can research the agent, whether it's through the social media channels or whether it's through their website and, and get a feel for them. And even videos like this that people are watching and going, you know what, um, what, what they say resonates with me. I like, you know, what they're saying. I like their, their knowledge. I like that other people have used their services and have found it to be of value. So I think that's a great place to, um, you know, to start with for people. Or just definitely online, mainly. Absolutely. How about you guys? But I mean, basically about the same, but for yeah. us, mostly it's been realtor.com and like the Zillow's and truly as we have a bunch of yeah. trip down sites, um, but we like people to get more accurate information. So that would be more like the realtor.com or MLS or contacting your local professional. Yeah. They always know what's going on. But um, on, what was the question? Oh, you had mentioned also about, we were telling you that our, we've had some changes for closings and on our closings, We've gone to like a wiring where people can't bring cash to closings and um, we have to wire the funds. And you were telling us that people in Australia would see things where they could like buy a house. Yes. It was like a scam and it's kind of related to this, the same issue we're having here. Yeah. It's not really, really great that people go online, they see a little cottage and they think, oh my gosh, that's so cute. It's only $50,000. That seems really cheap. Or it must have termites or there must be something wrong with it. But that's okay because we can do the work over 10, 20 years and that can be our dream or forever home when we retire. And then they wire the money to some Western credit union in the middle of nowhere. And not only is the credit union nowhere to be seen, the house is not to be seen and they lose their money and, um, you know, end up in tears. And it's a sad story, but unfortunately it does go on and people have got to be so aware. And I, that's why I think it's really important for people to be able to connect with other realtors like yourself. If yeah. there's I mean, that's, that's don't know. we don't realize how much it affects other countries. I mean, it just, it's different in every area, but, I think that's really interesting to know that that's a that's a big danger to everybody. Yeah. People need to know about that. But in America, I think most people see the house they're going to buy. They come, that's right. And uh, there's a lot of protection in that. Once you've seen what you're getting, uh, yeah. that's that's important because uh, everybody's thinking about: is this a great house or? A, you want to look at the neighborhood, you want to look at the community, and there's so much more to look at. So, Yeah, absolutely. No, I think um, that's very much the traditional way of people have bought houses, and I love that, that they can go out, see it, feel it, and, you know, look at the neighborhood because it's really important when people are buying a house. It's not just about the house. It's about 
what's surrounding the house. Um, hi, Heather. How are you going? Heather's just started to watch us girls as well. Um, yeah, it's about the surroundings. Like we live by the Hawkesbury River, which is lovely, but with the river comes the flood. So people need to be aware that maybe their insurances might be a little bit higher, which is okay. You just mitigate against the risk of a flood coming through. Um, there's some other things that, you know, there's agricultural out here. So we've got turf farms, we've got mushroom farms, we've got all sorts of different things and lovely smells that come um, at different times. So you just got to make sure you buy in the right area or, or one that um, doesn't have you downwind from one of those channels and, uh, <laughs> you yeah. know. <laughs> finding um, different areas there but uh, like in Ohio because you're you're in Springfield Ohio right right tell me what's the surrounds like there what are what's the parklands like what's what why do people go to um, Ohio why do they love that the Springfield oh it's tricky well I'll say one thing before she starts but it's very cost efficient and so it's a lower I mean we're in the middle of the country and we have the the weather changes like constantly but it's not as severe our weather's not as severe but it's very affordable. Now go ahead. She loves Springfield and she'll, she's a good commercial person. Yes, I'm, I love everything about it. Yeah. Because I personally feel it's safe. There's always going to be neighborhoods anywhere that aren't so safe. But overall, I feel very comfortable in our community and I don't worry about those kind of things. Um, we are on one of the largest aquifers in the world. In so our water is yummy. We have wonderful water. Yeah. <laughs> we're Best coffee ever. We're surrounded by farms. We have lots of farmland around our community. Um, and our community has been getting smaller. We're at about 58,000 about now, I think. And we used to be around 72. So yeah. what happened is our we have a wonderful chamber of commerce, and they're very aggressively looking and bringing in new businesses to our community, which is very important to us. And as she said, it's, it's inexpensive living. It's so you can buy a whole lot more house. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot I, more affordable. Grace is yeah, saying, we have great buy, I'm closing on a, it's like 4,500 square feet house, like five bedrooms on Friday. And it's going to be, that's like 215,000. I mean, it's, it's huge. huge. It's three floors. I mean, you know, but you just can't get that much house in a lot of places in the country. And, and tell me, what would that rent for? What would something like that rent for? Do you think that would Which go for? That? That's the one on Earth. Oh. 1200 maybe? Yeah, right about that. That's do you right. have rentals in your area? Is that Do you do a lot of leasing and that kind of thing in Australia? Yeah, we, we do rental sales and strata. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different opportunities in the area we're not so much the medium and high density that you have closer to the cbd but that will certainly come with time i think because we are on a train line we've got great access to transport we're 15 minutes to rouse hill um, we've got the beautiful hawksby river as, as i said you know surrounded by agricultural and farmland it's a beautiful place to live so I shouldn't be telling everybody that's such a great place to live because there's only going to be more people that want to come out here and live, but uh, that's okay. You know, I don't mind sharing the secret. But, we don't uh, have mass transportation here in yeah. Ohio. Yeah, we don't have anything, really. That's, yeah. that's, well, we, we have trains, but... Well, I mean, not in Ohio. Like, not well, not really much in Ohio. Toledo. Yeah, some parts in, in uh, far north we have some. Yeah. 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 So, but, yeah, that sounds where you are sounds beautiful. Yeah, no, I think we're both lucky. It's very similar communities because we've got about 60,000 in the, the LGA of Hawkesbury, um, but there's any number of suburbs within that that area. So it's an interesting mixture. Um, Heather's saying Springfield is beautiful and that her kids come with his family to get to Springfield's water because Grace loves the water apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grace is my daughter. Yeah. She, uh, hello, Grace. She How are you? Daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And Amy was also adding to that what we were talking about before with making sure that the correct persons, you know, owning the house check the title or, or who checked the title on that one. So, yeah, obviously somebody might not have checked the title if they yeah. um, bought a house for $50,000 and, you know, it was somewhere they didn't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. our attorneys are, are, we have title companies close all of our loans and that is the practice. They, of course, always do a title check. I think they're easier here than elsewhere because our history isn't as long. And okay. so 
that are a lot older. So they're very reasonable to get your closing cost uh, that you need to purchase the house. They're getting higher and higher, but they're still reasonable if you compare it to other places. But I was going to ask you about the average price home in your area. What would you say your average price home is? Yeah, the average price point for us is between that 550 to 650 range, depending on which suburb, because it can vary greatly and it depends also on what people are buying. So if you're only buying a two bedroom unit um, versus a five bedroom house, the, the price range would be different. So you can buy things anywhere from sort of 379, um, 380 for a two bedroom unit right through to multi million dollar properties that are on acreages that are just beautiful. But Either way, it depends on your lifestyle, doesn't it? It depends on what size house that you want and what is important to you as a family to identify before you go ahead and find that suburb and that house. Yeah, well, our average price town in Spring or price home in Springfield is about a one hundred and nineteen thousand dollars. Wow, is that less? Yeah. Now, nationally, uh, our country has had a, a very short supply of inventory of houses. Yeah, like it has been so tight that for a while things were just like on the market gone. I mean, selling immediately. How has your inventory been? Yeah, inventory's probably down a little bit. And what we're saying is that some of the the buyers um, aren't being able to find what they get. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not enough houses on the market. It just means that the market's slightly changing. We're having a lot of media feedback um, that is not necessarily positive. And it's not necessarily what's actually happening in the marketplace, but people do react to that and their fear factor comes in and they're very cautious about purchasing. So sometimes, you know, we might be heading into more of a, a buyer's market, but equally, um, if the price is, if the home of, uh, or the price of the home is, is correct and it's marketed correctly, you've got the right agent, all of those key factors, plus any number of other things. I mean, we've identified, I think, 88 things to do when you put a house on the market to make sure you get a successful sale I think if you do all those sorts of things um, and you've got the right people around you as you say like your solicitors or your realtors or whoever you know your loan officers whoever it might need to be you get a great result for your owners regardless of time of year regardless of how much the property is or, or those sorts of things so yeah. yeah what is your favorite kind of marketing like what do you do to like to get a special house under under contract yeah, as I was saying, like, I think there's 88 things that we've identified to do prior to putting a house on a market. But I think you've really got to get uh, the key is to get the maximum exposure in the shortest amount of time. And, you know, just making sure that that property is I, I believe every home has a story and that story should be shared with people in an emotional based way rather than oh it's a three bedroom house got a big shed out the back the girl's gonna love it guy's gonna love it just move in you know um nothing to do just get into it <laughs> i think that you know it's better that you tell a story about the home why the kids you know would love living there what are the activities that they can do what is it about the home that's so you know that people fell in love with when they purchased the home and then that that transitions through into the, the, the tail of the story. And um, I think every home speaks to you. You walk into it and you just feel the same. You know, you walk into a home and you go, wow, this is, this is great and this is lovely. And, and the family will tell you anyway. Whoever's living there will tell you the story of how they came about, how they had their kids grow up there. And, you know, little Johnny went to the school down on the corner here and, you know, we went down to the Hawkesbury River and we did kayaking every afternoon or Tuesday there's the kayak club. You can go down there and enjoy that or, you know, there's so many local cafes and restaurants and so the night night uh, life as far as taking family out and friends is great so from a marketing perspective there's so many options available um but uh, also not only that story the story's got to be shared on social media and also talk to as many people as you can and a lot of our business is a referral based business so the marketing with within that it's not so much marketing that we see it as it's more catching up with people catching up with friends and seeing how they're going and they go oh I meant to call you, Rachel, because this person wants to buy this house and, you know, everybody knows about it before you even have to worry about advertising it. So, yeah. In what about you guys? What are you finding? Now, Lisa agrees with you. And, and oh, I love telling stories. When we list houses, um, if they're older houses, we'll 
look up the public records and find out who used to own it. We'll ask questions about people because we do like, we feel houses do have a story. And, and people we connect do to work it. on yeah. doing that do as guys, a market. So do you have like open houses or do you do a lot of your marketing on your website or? I think, um, yeah, we do a lot of marketing on our website. Amy's saying, I always thought putting a story together, why the seller should accept offers or your offers, um, let the seller know why you picked their house so that this could help the buyer in the house. So that's great. Nice. Thanks for that input, Amy. Um, yeah, in regards to, um, you know, marketing the home, definitely online, definitely doing lots of different things, but it's, it's, um, I think I was inspired when I went to the, the association, National Realtors Association, whenever we caught up with one another first, Lisa. It was yeah, years yeah. ago, decades ago, I feel. Um, but that was when I got inspired to do open homes. Nobody was doing it at the time. And it would have been in, you know, the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, something like that. And nobody was doing open homes. And I was thought, no, I think it's Florida? important. Was What's that? that? Ran into each other in Florida? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Ago. It was. And funnily enough, there was no iPods. There was no Apple products that were raging at that time. It was just, you know, pick up the phone, ring your client sort of scenario or we'll put the, the bell um, in the slot and hopefully somebody will ring off that, put the sign up. But everything's changed. And I think social media has allowed us to keep in contact with all of our clients and that sort of thing. But coming back to the open home, that's where I got inspired to do it because you guys just do it so well over there. You, you know, your open home is like a party. It's like a rock show. It's it's yeah. just completely different to what um, Australians are used to. Yeah. And we try to, um, when we do opens, we try to make it um, like a neighborhood open too. Like, so we yeah. have special opens where we invite the neighbors so they can get to know each other and meet each other. And, and that often results in one of them going, Oh my gosh, I have the perfect friend for this house. You know, they, you know, they, and they get a feel for it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you do, um, you know, a cheese and bicky or a dinner or, you know, you'll do coffee vans or you'll, I mean, we're starting to get into coffee vans in Australia. We're starting to get into um, all those bits and pieces, but I don't think on the scale that, you know, you, how many people would you have to a, an open home? Like I, from what I've seen, you know, you could have anywhere up to, you know, 200, 500 people, depending on what house it is and what um, what style that you've no, got going. They're much smaller than that. The, yeah. uh, a good open house in Springfield would usually range about maybe a good one, maybe 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. um, that's about as good as they get. And, yeah. and But when we do a neighborhood open house, like we've had some of those that got a lot bigger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Realtors one too because you have a realtor showing too. Yeah. Um, yes, so. we do we do realtor open houses as well. Do you do that? No, no. I think um, it's very much a different scenario out here. I'd love it to be more inclusive with the local agents that everybody work together to help one another to find buyers and, and sellers for different houses because it you know not you don't always have the stock that somebody wants but you know somebody else has that property so I often refer through to other agents because you just want that buyer to oh, yeah. find exactly what they're after you know right yeah one wrote on here he said how what's the oldest house what how old are the houses typically in your area that you sell 1800s, um, early farm houses and estates that were in and around the area. We've got a very, um, we've got rich in history in the area. So 1800s is probably um, where I'm at. I mean, obviously there's some older houses as well, but, um, you know, there's some dairy cottages, there's some workmen's cottages in some of the streets that they have. And um, as much as they used to be probably the most affordable housing back then, they're now becoming the prime properties yep. to own, the heritage style homes, you know? So what about you guys? What have, What's the oldest house that you would have? Mm. Um, well, our public records don't go back very much before 1900. So oh. if it's a house that was built in the 1800s, they don't know the date, it, they all say 1900. So yeah. Back so we don't get to go that. back much further. However, now you'll see like when they start redoing the house where they pull wallpaper down, it'll say like 18, whatever. And then so-and-so's name, you know, put this up or like, you'll see the history sometimes in the walls of the house. But as far as our record keeping, it starts like at 1900. 
Yeah. And then when you have things like our local council, they had a fire many years ago, so some of the records were lost for, you know, some people were probably cheering with extensions that they put on that they weren't approved um, and there's, oh, no existing structure. But, uh, you know, then there's other properties. I mean, I look at the different houses and if you don't know the age of it, sometimes you can find a stamp on the water meter, which is an interesting spot. Sometimes the electricity meter outside has stamps inside it, especially if it was built by a particular builder. They'll put a pest um, and building inspection stamp inside there as well. So that's one other way. And also the LPI office, you can get in touch with them and then they can sometimes give you dates as to, you know, when the house was constructed and local title, um, you know, as Amy was talking about before. So what about, um, you know, other houses? I mean, obviously you can buy, what was it, 112000 that you said? Is oh, the 119. 119 yeah. like that's amazing yeah. value and even with the dollar changeover you'd still be you know affordable house twelve hundred dollars return on that if somebody wanted to buy a house in america they get around well obviously fly to america maybe not maybe do facetime with you uh, walk you through the house see what it's like we'll introduce them to lisa and sue they go to the house they like it they come back to the office you make a time round table with buyer seller loans person Amy um, or somebody similar and what what else is involved with buying a house in America? Well what happens is first of all most of the people today get pre-qualified for a loan before they go out and look. So we like for our customers to already know what they can afford when we show them properties and if they look at a house and decide yes this is the house for me we will take them to the office and normally and we will sit down and write their offer for them. Just one side. It's, they don't all get together until we get close to closing. Yeah, so it's okay. just, they'd be working with the, the buyers buyer or the sellers. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so then after we write the contract for those people, then we contact the realtor that has it for sale if it's not us. They will receive the contract, and they will present it to the seller. Once... The contract has been agreed upon then uh, the buyer goes and does his makes a loan application and goes through the process of what needs to be done to buy a house and it's getting more difficult because they need more paperwork more qualifications more they're requesting to know learn more about the buyer how much money does he have and how what's income and what's his debt ratio and uh, it seems like they ask for more and more every yeah. year. The recession really tightened up everything. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so then it takes an average of six weeks and at the end of six weeks, hopefully we close the loan. It recently changed that they cannot bring certified checks and they cannot bring cash to the closing and it has to be wired. And so yeah. the buyer has to go to his bank a couple of days before the closing and have the money wired from his bank to the title company that's closing the loan. Then everyone meets at the closing, yeah. signs all the documents, anywhere between 50 and 200, depends. I've had one with 189 papers. <laughs> that takes a long time. And the, the money is given to the attorney or title company that's handling the loan. And they disperse all the funds at the closing. So if the seller owes a commission, they disperse the commission on behalf of the seller. Hmm. Then they have what's called a conveyance form. And it's a fee that goes to our county. And it's $4 per thousand. And any county can be different. But ours is $4. So... If it's a $100,000 house, that means they have to pay $400 that goes to our auditor's office that helps support that office. And they have to keep a record of these homes and their history and what they paid for, sold for forever. That's yeah. where the documentation. Yeah. So um, the seller gets their bank, the, the closing person sends the money by wire now, I guess it would be, but they pay off the loan 
Yeah. And after all of those things are paid that are due, then the um, seller gives the buyer the keys to the house and it's their house. And if they don't, sometimes they can stay. And in our county, it's an average of 30 days after closing for free. They have to pay their utilities. They have to take care of the house. But they can stay up to 30 days after closing. It's whatever is negotiated. Sure. Um, but what this, the seller's responsibility is if they're staying in the home and if something breaks, then they have to fix it because until they give the key to the buyer, they are responsible for that property. Same here. Same. So that, that's kind of how it works and it's an average of six weeks to close. Six weeks, yeah. Add something to that? No, it's pretty thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I think for someone, we've sold a couple of houses to people from Australia. Yes, we have. That have come in and they like opened a bank account here and, you know, worked out all the finances internationally. Yeah, it was a little tricky, but it's good. And they just have to make sure they get a hold of a, a, a realtor because of the scam. It makes me nervous with people doing anything internationally. Absolutely. Talk to, Cuban. Talk to yeah. any Cuban. Yeah, for sure. The other things they need to do is um, not only work with brilliant realtors like yourselves, but <laughs> also have um, a bank account, as you said. But I believe they've got to do a tax return in your country once they have that property and they're transacting with that property because it's income coming in, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it depends on if it's going to be a lived in or investment. So it's going to be an investment. And it depends upon the banks, but I had called one of the banks today because we, as Lisa mentioned, we had sold two houses to people from Australia. And what I had forgotten was they were Americans that lived in Australia. Oh, okay. So the bank that we called today, and we just asked what the qualifications were, and they called back, said, we forgot to tell you, they have to have American citizenship. Right. Now, that's in our county. That No, that's just that bank. Yeah, that's yeah. that bank. Yeah, so but I think they're all a little different. Bigger cities and cities that have more people from other countries, the, it could be a lot different. So I don't know if you can buy a house. I, I didn't get that answer because the bank didn't know either. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on your mortgage company. My son, Brenton, is, was what well, he does real estate in Chicago. So he's done some international deals, and he's actually on there. But, I mean, he's, I can't remember what country the people he was working with. I think it took like six or eight months or more to get the financing in place because they had yeah. to prove their funds in America, prove their funds there, and all kinds of different requirements. Maybe he fell asleep. I don't know. He was on here a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Brenton? Tell us. Um, but that comes back to what Sue was saying too and what Lisa, what you said is that, it's to be organized. Make sure before you buy a house, it's like in Australia, you've got to know how much money you can borrow. Otherwise, why are you looking at million dollar houses if you can only afford, you know, $600,000 houses? Right. And you don't want to disappoint yourself for the whole process of, oh, I've found the house that my dreams, I'm just in love and I can, it's my forever home, I'm never going to move. And then they just know, okay, sorry, you can't get the finance because of X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with what you're talking about. If they're organized and they get all the processes done, they do all the things, check the boxes that they need to check prior to, then it all becomes part of the process and nobody gets upset in that regard. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and the bank I talked to today said what they'd like is for people to have money in the bank. In their yep. Sorry, I'm just talking up the battery because obviously technology needs power as we're doing this. So, and this is live as well. Sorry about that, Sue. No problem. Um, the banker said we like, if someone would like us to give them a loan, we'd like for them to put money in our bank. Yes. And he said that they would like a minimum of 25% down. And if you are buying a house to live in, it's one rate of interest. But if you are buying a house as an investment, the interest rate is going to be a little bit higher. And what so, is the interest rate? I um, mean, the cash rate for us at this, the RBA is 1.5, which translates to around about 4 to 6%, depending on, as you were saying, the loan type that you're getting. What sort of percentage of people um, being charged over there by your mortgage brokers, um, the financiers and the banks? 
Abby. I would say three to four and a half. Yeah, and Amy could probably tell us better. And Brenton said, by the way, it was Switzerland. The people oh. he was working with, he was working with people from there and from China that took yeah. him a long time, long, long time. Um, yeah. Brenton said, I'm being rude. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's all right. He's interacting now. He sees your son. Yeah. Person sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm rude. Anyway, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's had well, a hello, Brenton. <laughs> he's, he's on again. <laughs> um, has anybody got any questions that's on the line that's been good enough to join us here whilst we're live? Because the girls, I'm sure, would love to answer questions or any questions of me um, of houses that we have in Australia. Um, put it over to people. We'll wait on the line. And, and um, is there anything else that's interesting with the process, girls, that you think um, people don't talk about very often or the taboos of real estate? Well, there's one thing I was thinking about. It's it's insurance. We yeah. They have to have insurance and bring the policy or have proof of the policy when the house closes. And I wondered on a your your prices have to be a lot higher because your home prices are higher. Yes. But here, insurance on a hundred thousand dollar house can be six hundred to twelve hundred. I mean, it just depends upon the people and the policy. But yes. how much does insurance run there in Australia? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And once again, it depends on the location and what you're going for. We have, because we're flanked by the beautiful river, sometimes we have the flood levy, which increases the insurance policy. Also, we have beautiful bushland. So sometimes there's a fire levy involved with that as well. So some of the policies, I mean, I'm in one in 50 flood zone and my policy is about $3,000. Um, you can get policies that are as affordable as, you know, $1,500, $1,200. Um, there's some policies that are just prohibitive to have, I think, that have been offered to properties um, in the closer to the heavier flood zones that are, you know, up to $20,000. Um, from some of the insurance companies. So I would say on average, you know, that $1,500 to $3,000, depending on what what um, the levies are that you need to mitigate against, so whether it's flood or whether it's fire or, you know, also what your contents are in the house too, because some people don't have contents insurance. Some people just have the building insurance, which covers you for um, different things and what the contents is. So the contents insurance is basically if you tip your house upside down, what you're left with, that's that's your contents, whereas everything else is in the building insurance policy, as they've explained it to um, us over the years. So also, would it be correct that you pay real estate taxes on your houses? Yeah, we, we do have taxes. It's mainly from government. Hi, Summer. Nice to see you watching. <laughs> Um, yeah, mainly in regards to stamp duty, um, they've brought back the first homeowner grant to assist with the, the stamp duty process. Um, there's a cost involved with that. And, you know, the average home would be anywhere from, say, 15000 15, through to about 25000 on a, um, you know, 500 plus home. It just depends on what you buy and how you buy it. But, uh, yeah, there are those taxes. There's also the other taxes that you were talking about with the loans and the mortgage and the stamping of the documents when you go to settlement, which the conveyances um, look after that on settlement as well. So, um, plus, you know, you've got your, your solicitor costs and you've got your real estate agent costs when you're doing that process. But often when you have those professionals involved, they manage to make the process seamless, like what you would do over in the States, you know, and there would be no stressed people when they're buying and selling from Sue and Lisa at real estate <laughs> too. Um, and that would just sort of go straight through the process and uh, straight to settlement and everybody would be happy. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. But I, I know that you're pay is much higher in Australia than it is in America. So right, okay. Or there's, houses are more affordable than... Oh, you mean like this, it's a different... There, like, yeah, like your minimal, minimum pay. Minimum wage type stuff. Yeah, minimum wage. So what's your minimum wage? Like income. You, I mean, they talk about realtors' uh, minimum wage around about that 37000 if people are just starting out in real estate. But, you know... It's, the world is your oyster but when it comes to any any jobs really um minimum wage would probably be similar to that i would say i i'm not exactly sure as to 
what the cost of that would be, but probably in and around those sort of figures, um, you know, thirty to fifty thousand dollars, I would say, would be somewhere in that radar, which is not that great. It's interesting your perspective that Australians earn more than Americans, which may be true as well. But um, if you ask an Australian if they're earning enough money, sometimes they'll say, "Oh no, not earning enough money." You know what I mean? So everything's relative, I think. And um, yeah, what, what's the minimum wage over there? Well, Brenton can probably answer that. I think it's around fifteen dollars an hour. Is about right. That yeah. sound, it, and I was in Australia a few years back, and I know um, your minimum wage there. Or I don't know that you. What well, was the area that you? So what part of Australia were you in? Sydney. Is that close? That's close to you. Yeah. Yeah, Sydney. Yeah, we're about forty-five minutes to an hour away from Sydney. Yeah. yeah. So she had a. Um, international students that stayed with her and then she went and visited them for their 21st birthday yeah wow oh how exciting yeah sydney's so beautiful we've got the harbor one of the greatest harbors in the world i think and we're the opera house and it's just so beautiful it's so magic so i'd love you guys to come out and visit sometime and oh, game and, on. Up and um okay. if not we'll just uh, catch up at the nar conferences on a regular basis <laughs> as we do <laughs> and have I done yeah. on Facebook you don't think about when you go to convention a lot of people don't realize how many people they have the potential to meet and from all over the world yeah I mean, remember we sat at that one meeting in San Francisco and I mean there were people from everywhere and like the woman next to me her uh, she was from like the Honduras and they were having a big storm I mean it was I forget what it was but we were sitting amongst all these international realtors it, it that I forget what it was, but we later went on to that concert. Remember, <laughs> it was right, wasn't it? A great concert, <laughs> I, mum was there as well. We were at um, oh no, that was a different one, wasn't it? A different realtors conference. No, no, it was mum was at that one. What, um,